Yeah, sure. So it, it's actually an incredibly prescient question. Um, and, and, and it's a really deep, it's, it's a deeper question than I think maybe people realize because it kind of gets to, to the heart of what is money. And, and I'm not, we don't have time to go too far down the rabbit hole, but the reality is, is that the Euro dollar market is kind of a secondary derivative market of the United States market. And, and I've talked about this before and what makes the U S dollar so powerful is the Euro dollar market. But because of the way the system is designed, money has to circulate. If it doesn't circulate, interest doesn't get paid, defaults start to happen and it starts a chain reaction where really, you know, you get a credit contraction and you get a collapse of the system. And so based on that, there has to be a central bank based on the design of the system. There has to be a central bank that can go in in that situation and recollateralize the system. In other words, put new base money into the system as the system starts to delever. The problem with the Euro dollar market is there is no entity that can recollateralize the system that is not a US entity. And so the only way that the Euro dollar market can continue to function is for it to continue to grow. And the old, and if it does not grow, the only way for it to continue to function is if the U S some entity in the U S creates base money that the Euro dollar market has access to. And uh, it, this may be a little bit too technical for somebody who's not familiar with how the system is designed, but, um, you know, I I've done some previous presentations that kind of walk through this in a little bit more detail. And so, so if, could we get to a situation where the, the Euro dollar market decouples from the U S domestic dollar market? The, the challenge is, is, is this base money. So the analogy I've used before is imagine a game of musical chairs and imagine there's 10 chairs in the middle of the room and there's a hundred people circling around those 10 chairs. Those 10 chairs are the base money and the base money is reserves at the fed and physical currency and coins. That's money that actually exists. Okay. All of the, the hundred, the hundred people that are circling around it, they are also money, <laughs> but they have been loaned into existence. Though it has gone from being, you know, 10 chairs to a hundred, um, through the process of granting loans or extending credit. And when the music stops, all of that money that's loaned into existence starts scrambling for the only money that actually exists in physical form, which is the base money. So they go scrambling for those chairs. The Euro dollar market, imagine, so, so you imagine this US dollar market is, is happening, uh, inside of a room. Okay. And those hundred people are circling around the chairs in a room. The Euro dollar market is in another room that encircles that room <laughs> and they're, 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 they're circling around the room, but they don't even have direct access or for the most part, don't have direct access to the chairs. And so when the music stops they they have to like climb the walls and bust down the doors to get in there, to get the chairs. So the only way for it to decouple and not have to have access to those chairs is if somehow they could figure out a way that it would always grow. Right. And I, I don't think we've figured that out yet, or they would have some entity outside of the United States would have to say, okay, we are now going to back all of that money that's been loaned into existence. And we are going to provide the base money for that system. And then on top of that, everybody who had already taken out that credit or was holding that, that those credits would have to agree that they would accept that new collateral from that new issuer as the underlying collateral rather than dollars. And so I won't sit here and say it's impossible to happen. But in my opinion, it's impossible to happen without a bit of chaos in the process. And I think the likelihood of it happening is extremely small. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that the U S might not stop providing that collateral to the rest of the world. And that's what kind of puts them in the driver's seat is the, you know, the rest of the world, they've extended all this, all this, all these loans and all this collateral, but they've done so under the assumption that the United States is going to continue to provide the collateral for the world. If they don't. That puts the rest of the world in a really tough spot. And that's kind of what we saw last year. And that's why I say, you know, when the U S raises rates and it makes dollars harder to get, it's because they don't have access to as many dollars as they did before. And it becomes a big, big problem for the rest of the world. 
And as and, and so as as a result of the United States, the United States government controlling that U.S. dollar supply, um, it, it 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 lets them wield the dollar as a sword. Um, and and it's probably the most powerful weapon that the, that the United States has out of all the weapons that they have. In my opinion, it is the most powerful because it's all encompassing. It doesn't just affect one part of of the world. You know, if if, if you drop a bomb in Yugoslavia. Or, or 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 Serbia or wherever it is, it's awful, and it would affect the rest of the world in some way or another. But it doesn't blow up somebody down in um, South Africa or somebody in Australia. But if you take rates to ten percent and stop exporting dollars to the rest of the world, it affects the whole world. And so, to me, it's it, it, it's and and it does it in a way that most people don't understand. Um, so, it, to me, it, it's almost like a stealth weapon. You know, the, the people who study finance and understand how the system works, they get it. But the average person walking down the street in, you know, Oklahoma City probably has no idea what the euro dollar market is and why that affects them. Or in Adelaide, Australia, right? Or in Durban, South Africa. Um, you know, they're just going on with their normal life, trying to, you know, get to the end of the day and into the week and go have a beer on the weekend. I mean, they don't understand that the, the Federal Reserve raising rates affects their job halfway around the world. But it does. So I didn't think we'd go down this rabbit hole, but the analogy was strong enough that I kind of want to poke at it a little bit in that um, we have this debt ceiling conversation that's been going on for so long. You, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you've been vocal about how, generally speaking, it's just a circus, but we, we, it does feel like the circus is coming to a head here. We're going into a, a three-day Memorial Day weekend in the US. Maybe on the other end of that, there's a resolution. You've talked about in various forums where no matter what they kind of decide short term, it's probably um, bullish for the dollar. Now, when you're talking about these euro dollar markets and you're talking about the impact, whether it's even intentionally weaponized or not, the impact the dollar has on, on global markets, just because the Fed is doing its own monetary policy with its own dual mandate and its own objectives here in the US, but you have markets like Turkey that are now creeping into the headlines again because they're having yep. issues and they're getting, I think they're getting dollar swap lines from other countries. So it's kind of good. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of goes into your analogy. Now, if in the event the solution is that maybe even the US themselves or the Fed or the Treasury end up providing more base money to this periphery, this euro dollar market. How do you think, Do you, is it another one of those similar to the debt ceiling situation where in both instances, whether they retract base money or add more to the system to help out the euro dollar market, in both cases, do you see those bullish for the dollar at least short term? Well, in general, if they, if they were to go back to, if the US were to start extending swap lines. And so if you remember back in March, they, they, they kind of made this announcement that they went from, I think from, 30 day swap lines to seven day swap lines. And then I think maybe even overnight swap lines. I can't remember the exact uh, tenor. Um, but in, in that scenario, they did it because there was a fear of a dollar shortage. So they wanted to make sure there was enough dollars available. Initially, typically when the US starts extending swap lines and those swap lines get drawn down, in other words, those countries take those swap lines. And I should say, this is still gonna start to get confusing. I'm gonna try, but I'm gonna back up a little bit. When the U.S. does this, they're not giving the rest of the world base money. They're extending them alone. So in that case, it's the Fed extending a loan to the ECB, to the Bank of Japan, uh, Royal Bank of Australia, whatever it is. Um, but and so when they provide that additional liquidity, that would typically be negative for the dollar. The reason that they would need to provide those swap lines in the first place is because the dollar would probably be getting stronger because of the shortage of it. So the the extending of the swap lines is probably negative for the dollar, but it's in it's in response to the strength of the dollar, if that makes sense. Um, and so if they came out and did that, I would expect the dollar to probably initially fall, but. I, it, I, to me, it's just what it does is whenever the U.S. extends a swap line, all it does is reinforce the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency because it's just extending more U.S. dollar debt that the rest of the world has to pay. And so, you know, it's it, and, it, and it's it's why I've been so steadfast and been so, um, 
or set, have such high conviction that regardless what happens in the short term, the dollar is going to end up rising again. And it's the understanding of how this works is why even though after COVID, when they came out and they extended these swap lines and they did all this QE, I said, listen, it's just a matter of time before the dollar goes up again. And, and that's what we had. And now the dollar's pulled back. And in my opinion, it's just a matter of time before the dollar goes up again, because all of the moves that have been done to try to help solve these US dollar issues, all they actually do is create more demand for the dollar. Uh, which is kind of uh, uh, oxymoronic, if that's the right way to say it, or counterintuitive, but that's kind of the way it works. So, and if you, you think about it, sorry, mm -hmm. let, let me make one yeah. more point. And if you if you think about it, why would the U.S. do something that would hurt the dollar long term? Right? Why would the U.S. help out the rest of the world in a manner that would not ultimately serve them? Right? I understand helping them out in the short term may be bad for the dollar, but why would the U.S. do something for the rest of the world that would ultimately bring down the U.S.? It, it, you think about it, it just doesn't make sense. Now, with the debt ceiling coming up and the potential that once something's resolved, they're going to issue a lot of debt. When you're talking about these swap lines, um, is there a particular collateral that these other nation states or those who have access to the swap lines need to pledge? And do you think yep. that you know, they're two different stories, weak dollar, you know, um, increased debt distribution from the treasury. Where do you think the uh, resolution in the, in the debt ceiling ultimately means for say treasury yields and what the Fed is trying to do in terms of, of curbing inflation? Yeah, so there's kind of two different things right here. So to, to get a swap line, what has to happen is the other country swaps their currency for US dollars. So these other countries, they have an account at the Fed, um, and the U S will deposit dollars for lack of a better way of saying it in those countries accounts. At the same time, those countries will deposit their own currency in an account for the fed at their central bank. And so the U S they can take the, they haven't had to do it, but they, if, if, if let's just use the Euro for an example, right? We give the, we give Europe. I don't know, a billion dollars of, of US dollars and they give us a billion dollars equivalent of, of euros. And, and where does the other country get that money? They print it, right? So, I mean, that's newly created money that, 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 those, that those countries are, that are depositing with these. So, so the, the, the point is, is that when the, US, when the US, quote unquote, prints more dollars to give to the rest of the world, the rest of the world is printing more of their currency to give to the US. And then those have to be swapped back, you know, a week later, 30 days later, whatever, and with an interest rate. So those countries have to pay the U.S. an interest rate. They have to, they have to pay more back than that they've borrowed. You know, and that's how the U.S. The US actually makes money on, on the deal. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.